Founded in 1850, the Los Angeles Sheriff's Department is literally the largest sheriff's department in the country, and we are joined today by its 33rd sheriff. Delighted to have you with us, Sheriff Alex Villanueva. Nice to have you here. Oh, thank you, ma'am. There is an enormous amount of focus and attention on the behavior of law enforcement. I mean, it's intense and volatile, but at the same time, something that you have to handle and deal with. So what adjustments have you made recently within the LA Sheriff's Department to sort of manage all of this attention? Well, we just have all of our personnel just aware of what they're doing at all times. And it's you hate to have people working with their head on a swivel, but there's things coming from every single direction. And we just have to be mindful in terms of the impact that our activities are with the community making sure the deputies stay safe out there, doing the right thing, and that we're constantly criticizing what we're doing, getting that feedback, making sure th the folks out on the field understand the, the impact of what they're doing. So there has to be a very, a continuous line of communication between the community and then the deputies serving the community. Because they're, in essence, they're, our, my goal is that they're one and the same. Last year, I did 29 town halls, and I went all over the county, but we did it physically in person, obviously, pre-COVID-19, mm -hmm. and we met with, uh, I met with the, the leadership of the cities, and the communities we were serving, and then I met with the community themselves in a, in a town hall format open and uh, took questions from the audience and very meaningful exchange. And then from there, then I talked to the deputies on the shift and told them, this is what the community is thinking about you. These are some of the concerns of the community. and gave them really real-time information about the impact and how they're perceived in the community. And that was very, very effective, very insightful. Mm -hmm. and a lot of the community really appreciate what the deputies are doing. They had concerns sometimes that the deputies didn't really think about too much, like uh, school traffic safety around school zones, things mm -hmm. like that. That's very high on the list of community members. And you'd think in some communities where they may be experiencing uh, either gang violence or something like that, or maybe Cannabis shops always are up there high on the list, but number one, a lot of times, is just safety for their kids. Transparency is something that is a priority for everyone, and I'm assuring that you're feeling that way as well. And one of the things that happened recently with an officer-involved shooting um, led to the whole idea of body camps. So how are those going to be incorporated into the daily usage of the deputy sheriffs that you oversee? Well, I campaigned on it before right. I took office. That was one of my top priorities. My first week in office, we figured out how to get it faster, better, and cheaper, the standard. And uh, I thought it was a no-brainer, but it was, a uh, oh my God, the red tape we had to slog through, that it took us up until just Tuesday for the board to finally release the funds and go through the entire purchasing process. So October 1st, the first five stations are gonna have them. But it's gonna take us 18 months to equip the entire 5,200 personnel that we have out there in the field in uniform. So it's a it's a process that takes a while because every deputy and security officer has to have eight hours of training and how to use the camera. We give them the policy. They sign for the equipment so they understand how it's expected to be used. And um, then we're going to see once it once it, they're up and running in the field come October. Hopefully, we don't want a tragedy to to see what the effectiveness of it is, but it's gonna be available and uh, it's just nice to have that impartial witness to say this is from this perspective, this is what it shows. How are your deputies feeling about the fact that these body cams are going to be available to them? You mentioned obviously other law enforcement agencies, mm -hmm. but how are you, what are, what are you hearing internal? Uh, for the most part, everyone is excited and looking forward to them because we're an agency that our value is based on our trust. We have to be able to testify truthfully in court. We prepare reports based on what we see, what we observe. We have to, in front of a jury, you know, answer questions. And uh, we're judged by how credible we are as witnesses as, and when we enforce the law. And sometimes it's in very controversial circumstances, but politicians, they can say anything they want on TV and there's no, no repercussion. Same thing with activists, they can say whatever they want. The only people that are bound by law to say the facts just as they know them are us. And the facts in reality doesn't come at the pace that the 24-7 news media cycle or the social media cycle is measured in minutes. It doesn't happen at that pace. And they right away, oh my God, it's a conspiracy. You're hiding something. 
because you're not being transparent. You say, no, we're doing our job. When we have the facts, then we're going to present them. But we don't get to cut corners just to satisfy your curiosity. That's not transparency. Mm -hmm. Well, I, you know, you bring up a good point. Um, Controversial decisions are definitely part of any position of responsibility, especially one laden with the, you know, the authority. Are you surprised by the vitriol or the drama that surrounds some of the things that you say and do as sheriff of the LA Department, uh, Sheriff's Department? Well, it's kind of disappointing that people somehow can say, oh, I'm lying, I must be lying. You know, it's a favorite line. He's not telling the truth. and. When I was a, a deputy, when I was a sergeant of the department, I spoke truth to power in the most oppressive environment possible, which is under the administration of Lee Bach and Paul Tanaka, who are both federal inmates, as we speak. And they really knew how to destroy careers. And I didn't care because I came across corruption, cheating. I pointed it out. I put it in writing. I said, I'm not going to participate. And this is going to lead to the downfall of the organization. I was laughed at, ridiculed, isolated, uh, pretty much sent to the gulag. And, but I realized it, it was more important to me, my credibility, my integrity, than to buy in to a corrupt system, the good old boy crowd. In terms of recruitment, you have approximately 630 retirees. Um, needless to say, with the pandemic, the academies are on pause. Um, recruitment might somewhat be on pause. Are you worried about being able to garner the talent you need to continue with community safety? We expect that we're going to continue to hire the best and the brightest to come, and we're hiring locally, not out of state anymore. We want our local kids to grow up to become deputies serving their own communities. We're going to raise our minimum education level in January 1st to an associate's degree. And I think we're going to be the first largest, large organization to do that. And so we, we are going to have a supply of very good candidates from now into the future. Are you incorporating additional things into training once that happens in terms of sensitivity and de-escalation and all of those that is, hot topic buttons that are... Um, all those hot topic buttons that politicians are jumping on the bag to say we are already doing those things. Implicit bias training. We have a lot of de-escalation training. We have a crisis intervention training and a lot to do with, uh, you know, with dealing with the homeless, for example, with the mentally ill. We're constantly training. What kills us, though, is when there's a budget crisis, the first thing that gets sacrificed is training. Mm. And that's the thing what we need the most, and we need to meet more of it. So we're kind of robbing Peter to pay Paul to see where we can get the training to happen, and uh, let's see what happens. In your term so far, you've been on board since 2018. Um, what are you most proud of what you've been able to do? I think the permanent ban on ICE is uh, an important achievement. I got the board to uh, actually follow suit and make it permanent for future sheriffs. And SB 54 allowed that, gave the local board's authority to do that. So that's a good move. I think the body cameras, those are two big campaign promises that I fulfilled. And uh, hiring locally only. So we're well on our way to achieve all of the campaign promises I set out when I was campaigning for the office because I want to make sure I did what I set out to do, which is to serve the community and make it safer for everyone. What's happened in the 18 months I've been in office, and I look at the last five sheriffs before me, I've lived their entire careers in office that goes back decades in 18 months with all the crisis that we've had to handle day in, day out. There's a new crisis and social media, 24 hour news cycle, the expectations keep climbing higher and higher, and we just have to let people know that gravity still rules, there's a process that has to take place, there's no conspiracies. When we have the facts out, we're gonna deliver them to the public so they understand we're the good guys, we're doing the right thing for the right reasons. All right, well I really appreciate your candor, and I really appreciate you taking this time, because mm -hmm. I have no doubt that you are unbelievably busy, so it was really great to talk with you, mm -hmm. and uh, Thank you. stay safe. All right, will do. Okay. And that's a wrap on this LA Current.